Good evening and welcome to tonight's event. I am Miyako Hardeman and I am part of the events team here at University Bookstore in Seattle. Tonight, author Robbie Bach will be in discussion with Justina Chen to talk about his latest book, The Wilkes Insurrection. Robbie Bach is one of the founders of Xbox and The Wilkes Insurrection is Bach's first work of fiction. Reviewers describe The Wilkes Insurrection as a pulse pounding suspense novel that has compelling characters, dark web intrigue and a wonderfully twisted plot. Justina Chen is a critically acclaimed author and her novels have won numerous awards, including the best book of the year by Kirkus Books and the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature. Her most recent book, Lovely, Dark and Deep is out now. Links for the Wilkes Insurrection and any books mentioned during the talk will be listed in the chat. Please submit any questions you may have for Robbie or Justina in the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. There will be a brief Q&A session near the end of the discussion. This talk is being recorded and can be reviewed on YouTube a few days later after the event. I will now turn the microphone over to Robbie Bach and Justina Chin. Hi. Well, we are so excited to be here. And we want to thank all of you for showing up and especially University Bookstore. We love our indie bookstores so much and we're just so happy to be here with you. Robbie, I realize that I have known you for two decades. It is crazy. And I was thinking about tonight and I just thought, you know, what, what I want people to know about you is actually your incredible, magnificent heart. This is a guy who, as president of Xbox, when I came to interview with him, you came down the stairs to meet me in the lobby before my interview day started. And you specifically knew I was nervous and you told me you're gonna do great. And I will never forget that because it was so kind. It was just so kind. So I love the fact that you could write these devious, twisty, this devious, twisty novel with that such a kind heart. Um, and so Robbie and I actually worked together. I was his speechwriter when he was the head of Xbox. We were doing about five speeches a week, we, he. Um, but we were doing more than speeches. We were actually doing storytelling because I have witnessed with my own two eyes, Robbie captivating audiences of 14,000 and greater holding them riveted in the palm of his hand when he was talking about business strategy. So you could just imagine what the man can do when he's talking and when he's actually writing and plotting a thriller. I am so absolutely delighted to talk to you, Robbie, um, about your second book, your first debut novel, this political thriller. Hey, can, so can you tell us a little bit about the book? Well, first, before I will do that, but before I do that again, I'll add my thanks to University Bookstore for uh, putting this event on. Their support is absolutely wonderful. And if you're an author, having a local bookstore being willing to take the time to support you and help you get started, it, it truly is amazing. And I hope everybody supports uh, University Bookstore uh, going forward. And I also want to thank uh, I call her, her official author name is just Tina, but to me, she's just Tina. So I want to thank Tina for, uh, for agreeing to MC tonight and ask me some questions and to carry us through. So the Wilkes Insurrection uh, is a thriller and it's, it's absolutely focused on um, exciting you, surprising you and creating those twists and turns that thrillers create, but it started with characters. And so it started with me literally writing a hundred pages of character arcs without a plot. And those characters formed the foundation for the plot and then came together in a plot that um, sort of grew from the pages of those character arcs. Um, and so it is, a, it is a book that has techno elements in it. So with my technology background, you can imagine there's some technology twists in the book. Um, it has... Um, some political elements into it, and in, in some ways as a, as a political thriller. Um, but to me, most importantly, it's a thriller where the characters come alive on the page and where they interact in ways that feel both um, uh, surprising and cool, but also intensely human 
I mean, one of my key focuses, I've let a, uh, read a lot of thrillers and sometimes the characters just don't, they feel super real, not real. And I wanted these characters to feel very real. So that's the guts of the Wilkes Insurrection. The last thing I'll say, it is absolutely a contemporary thriller. It is about our country right now. And I wrote most of the story in, in 2016 and 2017, and then have spent a lot of time as a first time author refining and, and updating the concept. And, and I watched as things I wrote about in 2016 and 2017 sort of came alive in, in our country, which was, I will say, a bit surreal. So it's, it's about the here and now, and uh, I hope everybody loves it. Oh, I think they will. And one thing I wanted to dig into with you was the characters. And I think that is really, as you know, when I read, I think one of your first drafts, the characters were so compelling because they were real, they right. were authentic. And I love the fact that here we have a thriller where the characters truly feel like real people. How did you do that? You know, it's a, <laughs> yeah, I wish I knew in some ways. I, you know, to me, these, these five character arcs that I wrote at the beginning were characters that have been in my head, running around in my head for maybe 10 years or so. Yeah. You know, my main character is Major Tanika Smith. And my dad served in the Navy in, in World War II. Uh, I've always had deep respect for people who served in the military. I do some work with Boys and Girls Clubs, which does work on 500 US military bases around the world. And so the idea of a military family and what it's like to be in a military family and serve has always been sort of in the back of my mind. So I wanted to try to write about that. Uh, Johnny Humboldt is a, you know, sort of a business oriented entrepreneur. And you know, I've, I've interacted with that audience most of my professional, uh, professional life, but he and his wife you know, have a very complicated relationship. And I think relationships are rich and real and a very human part of, of what we do. And so that's where this got started. And then you land those characters in the midst of the challenges and craziness we have in our country right now, and suddenly you have a thriller. You know, in a way, this book started almost as a drama, and then I quickly realized it wasn't a, a, a human drama at all. It was absolutely a thriller with very human characters. Mm. Do you think you will, when you think about your next piece of work, whatever sure. it is, right. um, do you think you'll stretch your wings and try another genre or do you think you might want to stick in the same? No, I think I'll probably stay in the same genre. And uh, the reason is, uh, you know, I think one of the, one of the uh, powerful things about this story is I think there are characters whose arcs are not complete. Yes. And I think there are characters who have more to tell us. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think I would, I think I will feel incomplete if I don't decide to write more about these characters and about what happens going forward. You know, and, and Tamika uh, Smith, who, uh, as I said, is the, the, the primary character in the book, has kind of gotten under my skin. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I, I think, gosh, what would Tamika do in this character, which is a little strange, I suppose, but I, I, that's the way I, that's why I think about it. And so I think there's more, more to do there. And the thriller genre to me opens up all kinds of possibilities for creativity and, uh, and new ideas. You know, um, I sometimes feel like my characters talk to me all day. And their yeah. world is so real to me. It's almost as if they are real. I mean, do you do you experience the same thing? Yeah, I do with a number of the characters. Um, uh, and in fact, I could go through all of the main characters and I can put myself in their room. Yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. you know Bryce Roscovich has a basement techno cave. I can visualize that techno cave. I can see the monitors. I can watch him with his hands flying across the keyboard. Um, I will tell you, in honesty, the, the, the two characters I had the hardest time putting myself in their head were my villains. And Obey Bin Latif and, and Ford Wilkes, you know, I really had to work to get myself in their head mm -hmm. and to kind of visualize wh where they are. And, and, I, and I got there. But, you know, that's harder. It forces you to stretch as an author to do something and to be someone who you're just fundamentally not. And exactly. that is super, super challenging. 
well, I think you did a good job inhabiting their characters as well, you know. Um, so one thing that I do is I create these vision boards. Um, mm -hmm. I used to do them um, um, with with like magazines, etc. But now I use Pinterest. Do you have like a vision board for your your novel? You know, it's funny. I don't. And this, this goes back. My wife, who has been Pauline, has been such a wonderful support as I as I've gone through this process. But she's always asking me, well, why don't you go to a writer's camp? Why don't you go to a place where you, quote unquote, learn how to write? And and so I don't. And, and, and of course, being a stubborn, a stubborn guy who just likes to experiment and do things, I just started writing. And so I don't I don't know that I have actually some of the traditional tools that authors use. To me, the equivalent of that vision board yeah. is a four mile walk with Roscoe, my dog. I love that. And so the vision boards in my head. And I'm thinking about this plot problem I have and this character issue I have and how do I how do I make this evolve? And Roscoe's walking along with me and I'm probably listening to music, honestly. And an idea comes up and I go, oh, of course. Yeah. Like, you know, as a, as a small example, people read the story, we'll discover Bryce Roscovich. Bryce Roscovich was not one of the first five characters I wrote and was not in much of the initial draft of what I did. And he is now one of the most important characters in the book. He came into my head on a dog walk. And I was like, oh, of course. And it completed, it connected like three different arcs in the, in the book in a way that I hadn't imagined at the beginning. Um, and gave the book more dimension and put a character in the book who's completely different from everybody else. And, and that was just such a wonderful thing. And that happened on a dog walk. Mm -hmm. I love it because I think that's when your subconscious kind of releases when you're right. Yeah. Okay. So Xbox is about to celebrate. It, it is celebrating its 20th anniversary. Yeah. Wow. Can you talk a little bit about how being steeped in gaming for so many years, how that impacted the way you approach story? Yeah. I, you know, when we, if you talk to the original Xbox team, I'm in fact going to see them on, on, on Friday night. Um, and, and, and if you talk to the original Xbox team and said, who on the original leadership team is least likely to write a novel, they would pick me a hundred percent of the time. And so when I started on that business, I was literally the business guy. I was the adult supervision on a team of incredibly creative, talented, but slightly crazy people. And so figuring out how to bring them together was sort of my job and it was running the business and building it. But I will tell you over the time I was there, I, had, I learned two things. From that team, I learned how immensely challenging it is to create something. You think about creating a video game, what are you doing? You're writing a story, you're creating characters, you're doing plot, you're doing scene, you're doing all of those things. And you're doing it in technology, which just adds a triple backflip to the thing. So I, I watched them do that. I learned from that and I just and, it, and was super impressed by it. And the second thing I learned during that time, I actually learned from you, Tina, you know, you changed the way I did speeches. Speeches for me were a PowerPoint deck with a beginning, a middle and an end. And what you told me was, no, speeches are actually about telling stories. And I take those two things from my Xbox experience. Mm -hmm. And I wrote my first book, which was a nonfiction book and was really not really storytelling, but more about closer to a thesis than it was to a, to a fiction book. And then I said, okay, I know how to write. I learned this thing about creativity from these Xbox folks. And Tina taught me about story. Let me see if I can put that together. And that's really what got me from being the business guy to being a fiction author. And it's a, it's a weird journey and an unusual journey, uh, but one that has been, uh, just to be honest, pretty fulfilling for me. Uh, it's really helped me uh, get myself to it to a new level. Uh, that touches my heart. I'm so glad to hear how much you love writing because I remember when I met you 20 years ago, I right. remember thinking, I remember we had a conversation where you even said that you'd love to be a writer one day. Yeah, I remember that. And I'm just so glad that it's come to fruition. One of the things that I think is so um, difficult 
the probably the most difficult part of writing is having to be patient, patient with yourself, patient with your creativity, patient in solving plot problems, patient in the revision. And I would imagine that watching these game studios labor for years right. <laughs> to create and not just a solid game, but something that's compelling, where right. you where you fall into the world, you fall in love with the characters, you really learn that 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 creating something great just takes time. Yeah, you know, I, you learn. I actually learned two things. One, it's very challenging, and it takes great time and great in that case teamwork because you have technical people working with art people, working with storytelling people, working with a producer. And oh, by the way, they have the business person saying the game has to be done by this date. Right. <laughs> Never conducive to great creative output. So you certainly, um, you certainly learn all of that. But the other thing you learn is sometimes it just doesn't work. Yeah. And you know, throughout this whole process of writing the Wilkes Insurrection, in the back of my head is this: How many games did we start on and not finish? And the answer is not a small number. Mm -hmm. How many games did we finish that turned out not to be fabulous? And the answer is there's some that you know we finished and they were fine games, but they weren't great games. And if I want this novel to be great and be successful, you have to sort of be out on a limb knowing that you might actually fail mm -hmm. and that the story might not in the end come together. And you know, that's why this book has been through, you know, literally 10 drafts. Because the early drafts were nice, they were well written but they weren't compelling and they weren't a great story. And so you just have to, you have to have the perseverance to stay at them. Yeah, it's totally fortitude. Sometimes yeah. I think writing is like 90% fortitude. Oh, and yeah. I, I think to myself, oh, 10 drafts, that's nothing. <laughs> we, uh, one of our speeches, I literally think we had 55 versions of it. Yeah, we I think that's probably right. Stage. Um, <laughs> you know, but this is a perfect time for us to hear if, if you don't mind sharing sure. a little bit of the book. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to read from chapter three. And look, this is uh, one of my favorite chapters. There's a bunch of them, and I would love to read from later, but that would destroy the, uh, the suspense of the book. So I'm going to pick an early chapter. Um, if you've gone to the Wilkes Insurrection website, you know that there's an airplane crash at the beginning. So this is not giving away any secret. So a plane has crashed on an a Air Force base uh, off at Air Force Base in Nebraska. And my main character, Major Tamika Smith, um, runs search and rescue there. And so this is the first time you meet her in the book. It's in chapter three and it's called The Crash. The call came at 1947. What the hell are you waiting for? Major Tamika Smith yelled into the phone. Hit the damn alarm and scramble the team. She slammed down the receiver without waiting for an answer. As a reservist, Tamika was scheduled to report to Offutt Air Force Base one weekend a month for training. At least that was the theory. With all branches of the military still heavily engaged in the Middle East, she was the acting combat search and rescue leader, or CSAR in Air Force speak, responsible for all emergency operations at the base. Practically speaking, she was stuck at Offutt. Her law career and job as a Senate staffer in Washington, D.C., on hold for the foreseeable future. Once in the Air Force, always in the Air Force. Thankfully, her quarters were just two quads across from the CSAR facilities, directly past the flight line. The sprint to the hangar would have done her Air Force Academy track and field coach proud. Tamika arrived to see crews putting on boots and donning fire gear. She almost knocked down a captain coming around a corner. What's going on, Major? He began a rapid fire set of questions. Who hit the alarm? Should I call the commander? How can I help? Tamika recognized him as the base commander's senior aide, a tall, thin drink of water from Louisiana. Slow down, Washington. Let me get on the mic, and we'll go from there. Breathe, Tamika. She grabbed the handheld mic attached to the wall and her cordless cable. Attention all crews. And then, hey, shut the hell up. Quiet, finally. Now more calmly, she began. Listen carefully. She tried to balance her sense of urgency with the need for people to take a deep breath and focus. We've got an inbound civilian 757 with 213 souls on board, 200 passengers and 13 crew. 
They blew a door at 34,000 feet and have lost significant hydraulic control. They're trying to dump fuel, but we should assume that fire and smoke are in our future. They'll be coming in from the Northwest on runway 12. Tough to guess about touchdown, but the pilot will make sure he gets over the airfield. So let's set up on ramp B, five minutes out. Obviously, this is not a drill. Air traffic control could have diverted the plane to Omaha or Lincoln, but Offutt had some decided advantages. In particular, its remote location reduced the likelihood of casualties on the ground. Her instructions would put the bulk of her team partway down Offutt's main runway. Given the likelihood of fire, getting stationed close to the scene would buy them crucial seconds to douse any flames and pull out survivors. But too far down the runway might make them roadkill in the wreckage. Washington. You need to call Commander Jessup, but he's not going to be much help until the press arrives. At that point, his unique pain in the ass skills might be useful. If you really want to help, you can pair up with me. The look on the young captain's face had equal elements of excitement and terror, kind of like a teenage boy about to get to second base with his girlfriend for the first time. To his credit, he didn't hesitate. Major, I've done some training, but you have to tell me what I need to do. Yelling above the sound of vehicles revving up, she kept her instructions short and to the point. Grab some gear, Captain, and follow me. Keys are in the truck. They jumped into a vehicle and raced out onto the field with Tamika directing him down the ramp toward the middle of the runway. Putting on her equipment, she realized she better prepare him for what was coming. Look, if this plane comes down hard, there'll be shit everywhere. Plane parts, luggage, smoke, and probably body parts. That did not improve the look on Washington's face. Just stay focused on our task and you'll be fine. Part of the team will jump on the fires, but our assignment is getting people out and away to safety. As the plane goes past us, we're gonna go like a bat out of hell after it on the runway. Get as close to the fuselage as you can, then stay with me. I've done this too many times before. Once in position, Tamika looked back down the runway, mentally tracing a line out toward the horizon. Dusk was settling across the prairie sky in hues of blue, red, and purple. Through the haze, she spotted the 757 with its wing and belly lights blazing. This was clearly not your typical approach. It looked like a boat bobbing across a rough ocean, first up, then down, now left, followed by steep right. Rev it up, Captain. It looks like he'll be lucky to get it down somewhere on the field. On the radio. Listen up. Stay narrow for now. I don't think they have much lateral control, and I don't want any of us to get hit. Once he goes by, we can spread out based on how lucky he gets. Let's make this count. The growl of the truck engines filled her ears. In that instant, memories of enemy attacks crashed in. The smell of smoke, the feel of heat, and the cacophony of sounds associated with battle. Tamika's ears rang with the crackle of her radio, the screams of wounded, and the continuing jackhammer sounds of machine gun fire. Staring straight ahead, Tamika fought to stay in control, to push back the unwelcome memories that sometimes closed in around her. Major, Major Smith? I'm here, Captain. Adrenaline brought her back to the moment. Just drive the damn truck when the plane goes by. With binoculars, Tamika could see the gaping hole on the right side of the fuselage as the plane shimmied back and forth across the approach vector. It crossed the outer boundary of the field, looming large as it sailed by. Go, 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 she screamed as the, cav as the cavalcade of fire and rescue vehicles took off down the runway. At the last moment, before touchdown, the plane lurched down on its left side. It bounced once and then broke apart. The midsection flipped over and slid across the end of the runway. Both wings split off, followed by a fireball. Sounds of the destruction boomed across the field. The initial strike had split the nose away from the main body of the plane. What looked like the first six or seven rows of the passenger compartment, along with the cockpit, slid all the way past the end of the runway, but looked upright and relatively intact. The main cabin, on the other hand, was in shambles. It went well off to the right side of the runway, settling upside down and facing backward. Smoke poured from gaps in the, in the shell. The last 10 rows of the plane had separated hard at landing and somersaulted into a ditch on the left side of the runway. 
surrounded by crap crushed debris from the tail. Let's get some foam on that main cabin on the right, Tamika yelled into her radio. Crew one, two, and three converge on the midsection. That's a fuselage. Four, you have the nose. Five, you're on the tail section. Let's move. She slammed down the radio and yelled at Washington. Put us right next to the big hole on the front of the cabin. You're going to want your oxygen mask on. They screamed down the last stretch of runway, then veered off into the sloped grass approaching what was left of Flight 209. As they swung around to the side of the plane, Tamika jumped out of the truck before it had rolled to a stop. She ran up to the open with her heart pounding. She took a deep breath, then leapt into the fire. In that instant, she knew it would be for the last time. And that's the end of chapter three. You know, I have, sorry to, thank you. That was a great reading. I just have to interrupt you right now. It appears we're having some technical issues mm -hmm. uh, and our tech host is going to try and fix the situation. So just hold on a second and we'll see what's going on. All right. Okay. okay. And just let us know if you want me to if you want me to read read that over or whatever. That's fine. I can I can certainly do it again if I need to. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, let me check and see here. Let me just make sure that I I introduce everyone so that the people who are late coming in know who's talking on the screen before we begin. So uh, I'm Mieka Hardeman from University Bookstore, and tonight we are presenting uh, Robbie Bach, who is here. Uh, with his first novel, The Wilkes Insurrection, and he's in conversation with Justina Chen. Uh, and he's about to read a passage from his book, and we will continue with the discussion. If you have any questions for either Robbie or Justina, just submit them to the Q&A link at the bottom of the screen. All right, thanks. Okay, Tina, here we go. We're gonna, we're gonna read from chapter three, The Crash. Um, uh, for those of you who have had a chance to go to the website and there's a little video there, you know that this book starts with an airplane crash. So I'm not giving away anything. And Major Tamika Smith is a uh, search and rescue leader at Offutt Air Force Base. And so this is the first time you meet her in the story. Chapter three, the crash. The call came at 1947. What the hell are you waiting for? Major Tamika Smith yelled into the phone. Hit the damn alarm and scramble the team. She slammed down the receiver without waiting for an answer. As a reservist, Tamika was scheduled to report to Offutt Air Force Base once a weekend a month for training. At least that was the theory. With all branches of the military still heavily engaged in the Middle East, she was the acting combat search and rescue leader, or CSAR in Air Force speak, responsible for all emergency operations at the base. Practically speaking, she was stuck at Offutt. Her law career and job as a Senate staffer in Washington, D.C. on hold for the foreseeable future. Once in the Air Force, always in the Air Force. Thankfully, her quarters were just two quads across from the CSAR facilities, directly past the flight line. The sprint to the hangar would have done her Air Force Academy track and field coach proud. Tamika arrived to see crews putting on boots and donning fire gear. She almost knocked down a captain coming around a corner. What's going on, Major? He began a rapid fire set of questions. Who hit the alarm? Should I call the commander? How can I help? Tamika recognized him as the base commander's senior aide, a tall, thin drink of water from Louisiana. Slow down, Washington. Let me get on the mic and we'll go from there. Breathe, Tamika. She grabbed the handheld mic attached to the wall by an accordion cable. Attention all crews. And then... Hey, shut the hell up. Quiet, finally. Now more calmly, she began. Listen carefully. She tried to balance her sense of urgency with the need for people to take a deep breath and focus. We've got an inbound civilian 757 with 213 souls on board, 200 passengers and 13 crew. They blew a door at 34,000 feet and have lost significant hydraulic control. They're trying to dump fuel, but we should assume that fire and smoke are in our future. They'll be coming in from the Northwest on runway 12. Tough to guess about touchdown, but the pilot will make sure he gets over the airfield. So let's set up on ramp B, five minutes out. Obviously this is not a drill. Air traffic control could have diverted the plane to Omaha or Lincoln, but Offutt had some decided advantages. In particular, it's to 
its remote location reduced the likelihood of casualties on the ground. Her instructions would put the bulk of the, her team partway down off its main runway. Given the likelihood of fire, getting stationed close to the scene would buy them crucial seconds to douse any flames and pull out survivors. But too far down the runway might make them roadkill in the wreckage. Washington, you need to call Commander Jessup, but he's not going to be much help here until the press arrives. At that point, his unique pain in the ass skills might be useful. If you really want to help, you can pair up with me. The look on the young captain's face had equal elements of excitement and terror, kind of like a teenage boy about to get to second base with his girlfriend for the first time. To his credit, he didn't hesitate. Major, I've done some training, but you'll have to tell me what I need to do. Yelling above the sound of vehicles revving up, she kept her instructions short and to the point. Grab some gear, Captain, and follow me. Keys are in the truck. They jumped into a vehicle and raced out onto the field, with Tamika directing him down the ramp toward the middle of the runway. Putting on her equipment, she realized she better prepare him for what was coming. Look, if this plane comes down hard, there'll be shit everywhere. Plane parts, luggage, smoke, and probably body parts. That did not improve the look on Washington's face. Just stay focused on our task and you'll be fine. Part of the team will jump on any fires, but our assignment is getting people out and away to safety. As the planes go past us, we're going to go like a bat out of hell after it on the runway. Get as close to the fuselage as you can, then stay with me. I've done this too many times before. Once in position, Tamika looked back down the runway, mentally tracing a line out toward the horizon. Dusk was settling across the prairie sky in hues of blue, red, and purple. Through the haze, she spotted the 757 with its wing and belly lights blazing. There was clear, this was clearly not your typical approach. It looked like a boat bobbing across a rough ocean. First up, then down, now left, followed by steep right. Rev it up, Captain. It looks like he'll be lucky to get it down somewhere on the field. On the radio. Listen up. Stay narrow for now. I don't think they have much lateral control, and I don't want any of us to get hit. Once he goes by, we can spread out based on how lucky he gets. Let's make this count. The growl of the truck engines filled her ears. In that instant, memories of enemy attacks crashed in. The smell of smoke, the feel of heat, and the cacophony of sounds associated with battle. Tamika's ears rang with the crackle of a radio, the screams of wounded, and the uh, continuing jackhammer sounds of machine gun fire. Staring straight ahead, Tamika fought to stay in control, to push back the unwelcome memories that sometimes closed in around her. Major, Major Smith? I'm here, Captain. Adrenaline brought her back to the moment. Just drive the damn truck when the plane goes by. With binoculars, Tamika could see the gaping hole in the right side of the fuselage as the plane shimmied back and forth across the approach vector. It crossed the outer boundary of the field, looming large as it sailed by. Go, 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 she screamed as the cavalcade of fire and rescue vehicles took off down the runway. At the last moment before touchdown, the plane lurched down on its left side. It bounced once and then broke apart. The midsection flipped over and slid across the end of the runway. Both wings split off, followed by a fireball. Sounds of destruction boomed across the field. The initial strike had split the nose away from the main body of the plane. What looked like the first six or seven rows of the passenger compartment, along with the cockpit, slid all the way past the end of the runway, but looked upright and relatively intact. The main cabin, on the other hand, was in shambles. It went well off to the right side of the runway, settling upside down and facing backward. Smoke poured from gaps in the shell. The last 10 rows of the plane had separated hard at landing and somersaulted into a ditch on the left side of the runway, surrounded by crushed debris from the tail. Let's get some foam on that main cabin to the right, Tamika yelled into her radio. Crews one, two, and three converge on the midsection of the fuselage. Four, you have the nose, Five, you're on the tail section. Let's move. She slammed on the radio and yelled at Washington. Put us right next to the big hole at the front of the cabin. You're going to want your oxygen mask on. They screamed down the last stretch of runway, then veered off into the sloped grass approaching what was left of Flight 209. As they swung around to the side of the plane, 
Tamika jumped out of the truck before it had rolled to a stop. She ran up to the opening with her heart pounding. She took a deep breath and leapt into the fire. In that instant, she knew it would be for the last time. And that's the end of chapter three. Awesome. I Three things, Robbie. One, in the 20 years that I've known you, I think I've only heard you swear twice. So it's like a little, it's a little jarring to actually hear, <laughs> hear that from you and see it in your writing. Um, second, the technical details are incredible. I want to hear a little bit about how you got so technical um, and just helps with all the realism. But the third is, how do you feel about flying now? <laughs> okay, so the first thing is, you're right, I don't swear a lot, but the book, the book has a lot of swearing in it because it's the nature of the characters of the book. Yep. And so you have to be true to who they are. Um, so that's the first thing. Sorry, your second comment was... Uh, uh, technical realism. Oh, yeah, we, we should, that's like a separate comment. I had so much help on this book. People in the military... Uh, a pilot, technical people from the technology industry, um, you know, a, a woman who's a, a, a physical a, a psychotherapist. Hmm. All these people helped me bring together um, these characters and, and the detail. And then your third comment, which is the one I really wanted to answer. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on it. Keep going. Um, flying. How oh, do you feel about so flying? The truth, the truth of this is I hate flying you do i have flown over a million miles in my life um and i really don't like flying and so for me writing about a crash is uh you know in a way sort of strange in a way kind of uh, oddly therapeutic um but you know I, I i don't feel any worse or better about flying for me being afraid of flying is about control if i was flying the plane it wouldn't bother me but the fact that I'm not flying the plane, um, you know, doesn't suit my character. And so I've just had to come up with uh, sort of defense mechanisms to deal with that fear. Because I, for given what I do, I have to fly a fair amount. Yes, you do. And I just remember we would go on the plane and you would have your bag of chocolate. I yep. have never seen anyone eat chocolate for like six hours straight so i kind of thought to myself i wonder if robbie ate a lot of chocolate as he was writing this particular scene uh, you do not know you do not want to know how many chocolate wrappers were in the wastebasket. Uh, <laughs> i'm a, a little bit of a chocoholic i don't have many vices but that is absolutely one i love it okay so i thought before we would open up to questions from our incredible audience we would play a fast round of 10 questions. Okay, sure. you ready? Fire away. I'm ready. Okay, best time to write? Uh, 8 a.m. in the morning, no question. Yeah, morning time is my best creativity time for me too. Favorite beverage to drink while you are writing? Uh, I am a committed vitamin water zero. And that was not, I didn't, nobody paid for that brand statement. I, you know, you, you know that when I was at Microsoft, I, I drank a lot of Diet Coke until about uh, 2002, 2003, sort of in the middle of the Xbox thing. And then I went cold turkey on caffeine. So no caffeine. Wow. And eventually I got back to just sparkling water. And when I left Microsoft, I found this vitamin water, which has no calories and it's has a nice taste. And I, I you don't want to, again, you don't want to know how many bottles of that I consumed while writing this book. Okay. I'll have to give you some coconut black tea. My favorite. It powers me through chapters. Okay. Um, music or silence while you're writing. Oh, a hundred percent music. I've listened to thousands of hours. In fact, um, Sonos, which makes these very cool Wi-Fi speaker system. Sonos is in my acknowledgments <laughs> because I listened to so much music while I was writing the story. And in fact, music is a major part of this story. Um, there are quotes from, uh, from five songs that are used as the beginning of each section heading. Um, every, all the main characters have a playlist on my website. So you can click on that and get a Spotify playlist. And there's a playlist for the book itself. And to me, um, music brought the plot alive and actually informed parts of the plot. And don't you have playlists made for each of your characters? Every, every character, go to the website, the main characters, click on it, it take you to Spotify, you can listen to the playlist and 
it'll give you a sense for who they are and the storyline. And then the, the story itself, as I said, has its own playlist. Boy, okay, my writing process is completely different from yours in terms of music. I choose one artist, one album, I have it on repeat, because otherwise I start listening to the lyrics and then I'm out of my out of my you know, writing zone. And so I'm, I'm all over the pop, I'm all over the pop spectrum when I'm listening. I have a bunch of long playlists and I'm all over the pop spectrum. That is so great. Okay. Dog or no dog in your writing area oh uh, roscoe roscoe the the lab has a helped me write the book b <laughs> he is in the book and and c he probably watched me write almost every word of the book he sat next to me in my little writing space and uh sometimes with a paw on my on my leg but uh he, he was yeah. there the, the whole time my dog gets in my lap wants to help type yeah <laughs> sleep on my shoulders with her little head on my shoulders. Exactly. Yeah, so definitely dog, definitely yeah. dog, yes. Okay, um, how many miles do you think we have walked together? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, my guess is probably 50 or 60. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> maybe, um, maybe, maybe even a little bit more, but I'm just trying to do, every walk is sort of four miles, so you can start to add it up. It's probably more than 60. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe, 60 a year. I don't yeah, know. That's probably yeah. right. That's probably okay. right. Writer's block, fact or fiction? Um, I think it's fiction in the context of writer's block. Mm -hmm. I think there are creative lulls for sure, where you just, you know, the creativity is not flowing. But I, I'm not, a, I, in, in writing this entire book, I never got to a place where I, I just couldn't write. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the way I kept out of that is when I when I would come down in the morning to write, I'd spend the first 45 minutes or so rewriting what I wrote the last time. Mm -hmm. And that would get me back into the into the mix. And then stuff would come. And, you know, like there were some sessions where I wrote crap for three hours and then I had to fix it the next time. But I never I never experienced the oh, gosh, I just can't write. I think I better go leave and go do something else that that. Mm -hmm. At least for me, that never happened. Yeah, I've had um, severe writer's block for one of my books, Girl Overboard, where, and I realized the writer's block came because I did not want my character to do this one thing. So I wrote around it. I wrote her into a whole different plot line and I realized I had to throw away 150 pages wow. because I intervened. Yeah. And really, the character was, I should have just let her drive the story and make her mistakes, suffer the consequences, and it would have made, um, right, a better first draft anyway. Okay. Yeah. I totally Favorite, get it. Okay. Favorite interview technique to get the goods? Oh, yeah. I think this is more your expertise than <laughs> mine. I, 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 just re, I just remember when we're preparing for a speech, you never asked me, Robbie, what do you want to say in the speech? There was always these sort of 20 questions things about, you know, tell me a story about, tell me about your life thing. Tell me about that. So your interview technique was talk to me about yourself. Mm -hmm. And from that, you learned so many things about me. And then you put that all in my speeches and my speeches became more human and people liked them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think engaging people in who they are, and in their own memories and their own stories, people like talking about that. Mm -hmm. And from it, you learn a lot about them. Yeah, I, yes, <laughs> I, I agree. And I think um, when I'm interviewing somebody on a hard topic, I think getting them into a place of comfort. So right. talking about something that is safe and comfortable to them and it gets them into storytelling mode and then you know, then, then, then the yeah. truth, the truth spills out, right? The truth does spill out. Right. Yeah. In a really beautiful way. Okay. Longest writing session. Um, I've done, I've done seven hours. I've done a full day. Yeah. Um, and that's when things are just really rocking, but <laughs> most sessions don't last more than three hours. Yeah. Okay. So describe to me, what it feels like when you're in flow? Um, you know, it, it's, it's one of these weird things where time around you just sort of stops. Mm -hmm. 
and I, I don't really know how to describe it, but you're just, you're just writing away, you're writing away, you're writing away, and suddenly you realize you didn't eat lunch. Yeah. And that seven hour day, I, I never got lunch. I just kept writing. And um, so it is, it is a little bit of an out of body experience to me, to me, to be true. Yeah, I agree. It's completely out of body. And I remember it was one of the Xbox guys who told me about being in flow. And that was what, 12, 13, 14 years ago. Yeah. yeah. And I just thought, wow, that's a gift. I wish I could give everybody to have that sensation of just being so swept away yeah. right, by what yeah. you're creating. Okay. Number of years to write the Wilkes insurrection. Uh, start to finish five and a half. Wow. And so, and you know, so to be fair, I write about 30% of the time mm -hmm. because I've got a bunch of board work. I've got a company I'm a co-owner of a bunch of other things going on. So, you know, writing this book uh, was, um, you know, an activity that was intermittent. And the other thing I will say is the first draft of the book, which was significantly longer than the final draft, was finished at the end of 2017. So in a relatively condensed period of time. And so because I'm a first time author, um, I think this book took more rethinking, more editing, more careful crafting, and hence uh, a lot longer time. Well, I also think thrillers are also hard to write because they do require the plot twists Right. right. And then right. the red herrings, right? How you're misdirecting your yeah. readers. And so I think that there is so much more thought and craft. Well, not more, but there is there's definitely a demand for thought and craft. Well, it definitely took me longer than writing my nonfiction book. Right. Yeah. The nonfiction book was that flowed relative it was also shorter, but it flowed relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I know um one of the pressing questions that people have because you wrote this and you finished the first draft in 2017. Yeah. And you predicted the insurrection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, the one, people want to know how on earth, when that seemed like so ludicrous, right? To yeah. even imagine that it could happen here on American soil. And two, people want to know what your stock picks are now. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a funny thing when I, when I finished, that first draft of the book, uh, there's a scene in that book, which I won't give away, which isn't exactly the insurrection that you talk about, but which, you know, might as well be. And there's two or three other things in, in the book that happen that are part of my anarchist villains plot to, to take down the country. And in, you know, in the last 18 months, they've all happened yeah. in various shapes and forms. And it's a little weird um, as a writer to, to see fiction become a, a little bit of a piece of reality. Now, I, I will admit that I did not have a pandemic in the, in my draft of the book. And, and that got, that got added in a, in a, in a later draft of the book, because the story is so contemporary that you couldn't not have the pandemic in it. And by the way, my anarchist loved the pandemic. He thinks the pandemic is the best thing that's ever happened because it created, you know, more, more challenges for the, for the country. So, um, it is a little strange to do that, but, um, you know, it's fun sort of seeing the outcome. It is. It must be a little uncanny. Yeah, it's, it was, it's a little, it's a little unnerving, but, um, you know, I, I mean, I suppose, um, you know, the world we're in right now is a little bit topsy-turvy. So if you write a topsy-turvy novel, uh, you, you sort of get that. Mm hmm we still want to know what your stock picks are then. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> that's a place I'm not going to go. That's a place I'm not going to go. Okay. Um, outline or seat of your pants? Oh, seat of my pants the whole way. <laughs> the whole way. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there's a, um, the prologue for the Wilkes Insurrection, which is the very first part of the book that you'll read, um, was written... Uh, gosh, at least six or seven months before I had any idea how I was going to get to that part of the book. Yeah. So I, I wrote the prologue with a specific idea, um, characters, dialogue, et cetera. And I said, okay, now the rest of the book has to write me to that point. Um, no outline. And I know all of that is like counter to every 
instruction lesson you get at every conference and every uh, book. Um, not really. <laughs> not. <laughs> not really. But I'm just, I just, I just not that kind of writer, and so I just wrote until I got there. Yes, and I tried your method for the current. Um, I'm in a new genre. Um, so for NaNoWriMo National Novel Writing Month, uh, which is November, um, I'm writing my first middle grade novel for sure. ages 10 to 12, total seat of the pantsing. And I'm thinking, it's so freeing. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's more fun as an author. It, it takes is. longer. It takes longer because you got to fix things. Yeah, yeah, there is the fixing. I already see so many things I need to fix, but wow, you know, for every day, every day is really a creative adventure. Totally. So I never know where I'm going to go. Totally. Okay. And um, the last thing is really just a free question for you. What do you want people to take away when they get to the very last page of this novel? I hope people take away three things. Um, the first is, I just hope you love it as a thriller, right? I mean, thrillers are, people read thrillers for the adventure, for the surprise, for the excitement, for the intrigue, for the twist. And so I hope when you get to the last page, you say, wow, that was a great thriller. That's topic number one. Number two, I hope there's at least one and probably more characters that you just fall in love with mm -hmm. and who you find intriguing, interesting, challenging, whatever it is, but you say, hey, you know, I wanna know what's gonna happen with that character. Um, and then the third thing um, is I hope you walk away thinking, wow, that's where our country is right now. And we each have to figure out a way to sort of process that first and then decide what to do about it. And it's not a political statement of left versus right or Democrat, Republican or any of that kind of stuff. It's just, we're in a really challenging spot and we need people to engage to to do something about that. Um, and so hopefully you walk away from that with a little bit of, of uh, Tamika Smith fire in your belly to, to, to challenge some of those issues. Right, and I think on that note, I'm really hoping that people have that Tamika Smith fire. They run to University Bookstore. They snag your autographed um, copy of the Wilkes Insurrection. It will make a fantastic holiday gift. Um, and again, man, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Robbie, for writing this great book. And thank you, University Bookstore. You are a treasure in the Northwest. We are so lucky to have you here in our neighborhood. Well, thank you so much, both of you. Uh, we had some earlier difficulty, but you guys gave a really insightful and entertaining discussion. And we will have the discussion up on our YouTube channel in a few days. Uh, I also wanted to thank tonight's audience for attending. Links for the Wilkes Insurrection is on our website, and we hope you join us again soon. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody.